So welcome everyone to the session. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover today, so I think we should just go ahead and get, get started. Uh, so uh, this is the commissioning and science validation parallel session. Uh, I'm Keith Bechtel. I'm the commissioning uh, science validation lead uh, for the construction project. Uh, Chuck is, is, a, is also co-organizing the session. Chuck, would you like to introduce yourself real quick? Oh, um, hi, I'm Chuck. Um, I think most of you guys and gals know who I am. I'm the uh, uh, science, uh, system scientist, and also the uh, commissioning manager and lead the, uh, the sitcom team towards ushering this great machine into operations. Great, thanks Chuck. Um, so we wanted to organize this session today mainly to hear from, from you all as, as representatives of the science collaborations. Um, I'll, just, I'll just remind uh, uh, people of, of the guidelines that we discussed earlier in the meeting uh, regarding uh, these, these basic values that we hold as a community. Um, and also, uh, I've been, the next slide is on, is on the, some logistics for the session. Um, as we're going through the session today, please uh, post questions, comments in the Slack channel. Um, you can also post them in Zoom, but Slack has the advantage that uh, it's easier for us to, to track uh, later on. It's persisted. Um, so Chuck and I, again, are the moderators. Uh, Marcus has kindly offered to help uh, monitor Slack for questions. Um, and then also uh, we have two scribes, Jeff and Kevin, uh, who've agreed to uh, try to take some minutes in the Google Doc that's linked here. Um, I also posted that in the Slack channel, so, so people should definitely feel free to, um, to add to that Google Doc if, if we missed anything or you wanted to, to make your point more, more clearly. So, uh, so goals for today. Uh, this parallel session is really meant to be a starting point for discussion uh, as on the project side, we're continuing to, to think about our planning and preparations for the on-sky commissioning activities. So what we've done for, for this session to, to kind of kick off uh, this discussion is to invite the science collaborations to give snapshots of their current thinking um, in a series of brief presentations today. And we're hoping that this uh, will help to uh, inspire uh, the science collaborations and give them some resources and information about drafting uh, commissioning notes uh, that can be posted in the public domain. And then uh, we, can, we can try to use this uh, you know, for the project and the science community to work together uh, planning on-sky observations during commissioning. So I really just want to iterate uh, that, uh, that, you know, we, we're looking forward to further discussion and we're really here to, to listen to your input today. Uh, so in that spirit, uh, we have just a few short introductory slides uh, to set the context for today. Um, we'll also hear from, uh, from Lauren uh, giving some uh, some perspectives on the education and public outreach considerations for on-sky observations. So that'll be sort of the, the more sort of project-oriented uh, uh, context for the session. And then we have this series of talks uh, where we've invited representatives from the different science collaborations to, uh, to, to give their input uh, for the science-driven considerations for on-sky observing. So here is our current on-sky observing schedule, and maybe I'll hand it over to Chuck here just for a minute or two to, to talk about this. Yeah, I think the important thing to highlight with this chart is what's changed since last time we met at, at the last PCW. The last time you saw a chart that looked very similar to this, it was much more um, uh, densely populated with boxes of activities. So due to the ongoing delays in Chile, particularly with the dome assembly and subsequently with the telescope mount assembly and the pressures from the agencies um, to maintain schedule contingencies, we've had to con contract um, the on-sky um, uh, observing schedule uh, during commissioning. So what you see here are the two gray boxes, which are the technical integration activities for COMCAM followed by LSST CAM, and then the, the three green boxes, which are the uh, science validation surveys at the end. And previously, the three green boxes were uh, spanned a three month duration. And also uh, following each of the, the technical integration in the gray boxes, there was some extended observing. Those have been uh, contracted 
or eliminated, if you will, to um, maintain sk schedule contingency. Um, I, I do, while this, you know, is not as rosy a, a picture as we showed a year ago, I do want to emphasize that in spite of the contraction, we still expect to get significant amounts of data during the two gray boxes during the technical integration. And then before we move on to the next slide, I will just say that this was all pre-COVID, right? So this is um, up, in, up until the end of February, early March before the COVID thing hit. And the project will be uh, conducting a reevaluation and rebaselining of the plan and I will say that the instruction that I've received from our management and the leadership is that we should replan to do what is best for the project. So reinstating um, uh, past DSCOPE in its own right is not going to be something we can easily do. But if we say uh, to minimize risk on the project, we need this amount of time with ComCam and this amount of time with LSST cam and this amount of time with the science verification surveys, um, then that's what we put on the table. So um, I, all I can say is stay, looking at this picture here, uh, stay tuned and um, rest assured I am fighting for it and stay, try to stay optimistic that um, I, I fully expect that this picture will, will change uh, when we re-baseline the project. Keith. Thank you, Chuck. And I so, think the next slide, um, the first bullet, I've already um, mentioned that uh, we do, in spite of the technical emphasis um, during the early integration phases of ComCam and LSST CAM, I fully expect to get um, modest amounts of science quality data. For example, you know, as my experience with other instruments and other telescopes is that while you're fiddling around technically, you're going to get the system in a state that is producing uh, good quality data. And then you're going to say, okay, I'm going to stop fiddling on the technical side and let me just take a bunch of data so that we can start doing some analysis on the data. And I fully expect that to be the same here, that um, you know, it may not be as much as we originally planned, but it won't be zero either. So um, I think that's a further conversation we can have uh, as part of this breakout as when the opportunity knocks, where and when and what do we wanna look at um, during these moments of, of you know, taking a pause on the technical aspects and, and doing some data acquisition. So that's my comments on the first bullet. And so Keith, I'll hand it over to you now. Great, thank you, Chuck. So just in the interest of time and making sure uh, that we have time for the, the science collaborations to speak, um, these slides are here for reference, but they give a, sort of a, a quick minimal plan for the types of on-sky observations that we would plan, that we would do. Um, in terms of managing uh, expectations for community input, um, I think that the, ma the main message here is that uh, guidance from the science community is very welcome and appreciated to enhance the opportunities for science validation studies. Um, but there should be an understanding that this is a sort of a shared risk best effort situation. And as Chuck said, you know, where we have flexibility, we really want to uh, you know, take data that will generally be, be useful for, for various um, science verification and validation studies. So what we're proposing uh, is a process to provide input uh, where the science collaborations are encouraged to produce uh, some summary documents um, that can be placed into the public domain and then be considered by the commissioning team. Um, so we're hoping that the commissioning liaisons can help to, to curate this guidance um, the structure of these commissioning notes is very flexible. I mean, even something very short, like two pages, uh, will be very valuable. Um, any supplemental digital resources that you have are very welcome. And uh, if, if this input is provided within the next couple of months, it could definitely be considered as, as input to the project replan. But that doesn't preclude uh, additional inputs and, and iteration uh, as we get closer to on-sky observations. 
So we're, we're hoping that, that the project community can really uh, work together to refine these proposals over time. And this can be an iterative process. So I had a couple slides here that I'll skip for now. They're, they're available in the posted slides just to give some inspiration for what can be done uh, in, in a short amount of time. But I'd, I'd like to, to give uh, Lauren a chance to, to speak to education public outreach considerations. Yeah, Lauren, thanks, Keith. Are you here? Oh, yeah, great. I'm here. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, EPO in particular has like a few main goals that we're really um, hoping to hit the ground running with. Um, so we're hoping to right, start promoting awareness of the observatory as soon as possible. So the general public has a sense that we exist and what we're doing and why we're exciting. Um, and we're also working hard in construction to build tools that will enable people to have intuitive and meaningful uh, engagement with the data itself. Um, and so for us, getting commissioning data to start promoting those goals as soon as possible would be really helpful. Um, in general, we're pretty agnostic to the specific fields or cadence of observations. We definitely expect the science collaboration to be driving all of that. Um, but a few things that would really help us in what we're trying to do are, for example, um, color images of what I'm calling photogenic galaxies or nebulae. So the kinds of pictures we're all used to seeing that the public is going to expect when we talk about astronomy. Um, so in addition to using them to promote awareness, we can actually start to practice how are we going to promote, uh, produce these kinds of images regularly during operations to go along with all the social media and press releases that we're doing. Um, and then right now we're building all of our like, hands-on interactions with precursor data, but transitioning into LSST data as soon as possible would be great. Um, and in particular, we're building an all-sky viewer, so to try and get a sense of like, what is the scale of the survey that we're doing? Um, and so you can see we're also making it available on phones. I have a little picture here. Um, and so having some sort of reasonably large patch of the sky where people could, you know, pan, zoom, start to click around on objects to get a sense of how that interaction will work would be very helpful. Um, and also in color, we need to produce an algorithm that's going to generate all of these color images to put into these types of applications. Um, and then finally, we're really excited to promote the alert stream. It's something that's really unique to Rubin Observatory and having actual data to work with. Um, so I'm showing an example here of a snapshot of the bottom of the website we've currently designed that's trying to highlight just the sheer number of things we're going to find. So being able to do that and to put the alerts into our different data products would be incredibly helpful as well. Um, so yeah, that's it. We're excited to start using real data. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I'll ask uh, Chris to go ahead and, and set up for the, the presentation on behalf of DESK. So we have some questions, sorry. Yeah, so I, don't, I think we're gonna have to answer those uh, off, offline. <laughs> um, I'll, ta I'll, ta I'll take a look at that, but just to make sure that people get a chance to present. So Chris, go ahead. Okay, can you see my screen and hear me okay? Yes, it looks good. All right, let me start a timer. Okay, um, for those of you who uh, haven't met before, it's very nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Chris Walter. I'm a member of the desk. I have several roles there, uh, a lot related to commissioning and um, image simulations. And I'm also a member of Keith and Chuck's um, science verification team. And what I wanted to talk to you about today was a note that we've written in the desk, which is a, a desk note, which we're gonna post publicly with a set of recommended target fields for commissioning um, in the Rubin Observatory. And uh, this group was, this, this note was put together by a pretty diverse group of people from across the collaboration. So people worked with all the working groups in the, in the collaboration. And these people who you see listed here, many of who are at this meeting today, uh, actually did a, the bulk of the work working on the note. And I wanna tell you about it. So let me just give you an introduction. So the, the desk undertook a kind of approximately about, it's, I think we've been working on it for about two years now to understand and collate a list of recommended fields that could be used to test and validate our pipelines. So the idea here isn't really, you know, this isn't to do science, it's that the desk has a lot of, a lot of technical pipelines for doing things like, you know, shear measurement, we wanna be able to validate that software and make sure it works. And the outcome of this work is this desk note, which we wanna publicly post um, so the recommendations were driven by several drivers and, and kind of one of the main things was the need to characterize systematic effects since a lot of our science will be dominated by systematics as opposed to statistics. So the goal that we tried to do was to come up with a useful set of fields that would be spread throughout the year, especially because even now, even more with COVID, we don't know exactly when, the rec when, when commissioning observations will happen. And we wanted to come up with things that the project might otherwise generally be interested in using for science verification for, me, for meeting the uh, project verification needs. 
that if those, if those fields were observed, we could also use in the desk. And so I think you'll see that the high level recommendations and priorities that we identified are pretty much consistent with sort of current planned on sky observations that were already observed that were already planned by the project. And then, especially for this audience, really, really one of the main goals uh, of, of this work was to build a set of tools and resources for the whole Rubin science community. So in this talk, what I want to do is I want to, it kind of has two parts. So part of it, I'm going to tell you about our recommendations, but the other part is to tell you sort of about a, a suite of tools that we built that hopefully will allow other people who are interested to do this kind of work quickly and easily to, uh, to produce similar notes. So we really spent a lot of time thinking about that. And we've shared this notes already. We also shared this with the other uh, commissioning liaisons in the, from the other Rubin Science collaborations. So we're going to make this note, but also all the tools that we use to make what I'm going to show you today available to everybody. It will be posted on the archive. Okay, so first of all, what, what were the outcomes of the study? So we have a prioritized set of candidate fields. And as I said, since the time is important, these are, oops, these are organized by season. Uh, we have some priorities for how to do wide field observing. So for, you know, large survey, wide field observing, things like Stripe 82. We have some suggestions for dithering studies to try to understand, for example, uh, in the DDFs, whether to use sensor size or raft size dithers to get rid of, to get rid of uh, anomalies that are left over, how to do photometric calibrations. Uh, we want to get down to kind of a one millimag level. So we think we need something like 100 observations uh, for a photocalibrometric source separated by at least 30 minutes. Uh, and then we spent a lot of time making an inventory of external data sets. So space-based imaging, multi-band imaging, spectroscopy, astrophysical objects, spectrophotometric, standard, spectrophotometric standards, which overlap with the, Rubin, with, with the Rubin footprint. And actually, we hope that once we enter um, science, uh, ob science operations, this uh, will continue to be a useful resource to people. And then, so finally, we produced this desk note, which I'm going to tell you about, and software and tools to rapidly manipulate and explore, explore these proposed fields to share more widely. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring you, first of all, through sort of how we did this so you can see kind of what might be available to you or just give yourself some ideas of how you might want to approach this if you wanted to do it yourself. Okay, so the first thing we did was this is some screenshots I took of a Google, of a Google spreadsheet. And you see down here on the bottom a whole bunch of tabs. So there's a tab for each working group. So here's large scale structure, dark matter, clusters, weak lensing, supernova, photo Zs. Um, and, and, and here I have picked out part of the tab which was done by the large scale structure group. So each working group sort of went through and collected for themselves what they thought interesting fields were. So everybody loves the LSST DDF Cosmos fields. Everyone has that one. And uh, they wrote down in here, you know, where it was located, what depth they needed, what kind of cadence they were interested in why they chose these fields, what the validation goals were. There's other things on this that in the spreadsheet, which I can't show you here just because of space, but they also tried to catalog um, HST imaging, other imaging that was around any spectroscopy. So this was sort of the working group. This was sort of the scratch pad for each working group. And they could add what they wanted to this, but there's sort of a minimum set of columns and fields that everybody had to include. That, so we could, we could collate the information together. So here's, uh, so it turns out in Google Spreadsheets, you can kind of use it like a SQL database. So here's a sort of a, a, a query, which gathers all the things from all the tabs together. And you can see here, here are some ones from clusters, here's some one from photo calibrations. And this has the um, information that's sort of common to all the fields in it. So it's the name of the field, this is who's interested in it. I'll tell you a little more about these classes and pipes later, and the amount of area that it takes and what filters they're interested in. So then here's a more complicated query, which basically takes the information from all of the groups and merges them together. So if four groups are interested in the cosmos field, then you'll see here that it's four people want it. Uh, here is uh, information about what kind of field it is. And here you can see this max area, which is either nine square degrees or half a square degree. This tells you whether or not you can do the observation with the full LSST cam or whether you could do it with the commissioning camera and uh, the filters that you're interested in and where it's located. So then it turns out there's a really super neat trick that you can use, uh, which is if you export inside a Google spreadsheet uh, something as a CSV file, it gives you a URL which is basically kept up to date in real time. So as people edit that spreadsheet, it shows up if you, if you do this export. 
And then you can just read it in, for example, into pandas in Python. So what we did was we read these things in. So for example, if you go back and you look at this one, you can see the list is 2MO559 and then this cluster 1689. And you see it here in this list. And this has all of the information that was uh, collated. So now we have this in a nice pandas data frame and we can take it and we can do calculations. So now we have a set of tools that you can use which will calculate, say, as a function of time, year, how often it, how, how long it's up in the sky, what the air mass is, you know, where it's located, so we can actually uh, visualize it and make decisions as to what's going, what's going on. So the output of this, uh, of these tools, then, are a set of tables and figures which are basically uh, created by Python notebooks, by Jupyter notebooks, which we'll make available. And so the sort of the workhorse of this, this, this one was put together actually by Keith, this shows you, these are the names of the fields. This is where it's located. This is the optimal date on the sky that you can look for it. At that optimal date, what's the optimal air mass? This is how many hours it's available uh, at an air mass of less than 1.4 or less than two. And then if you wanna look at an air mass of less than 1.4 and air mass of less than two, these are the dates that you should look, okay? So we, we sort of did these calculations and built this, and then we used this information to build visualization and make decisions. Okay, so now let me show you, uh, tell you something about the note, and then I will go back and I'll show you some of those visualizations and tell you about uh, some of our conclusions. So this is to give you a little bit of an overview if you wanna read this note. Um, so in the beginning, you'll see a summary of our recommendations. This is a, a sort of a short overview of commissioning observation planning, sort of what, what, what Keith was showing you before. Uh, this is kind of how we're gonna use these things in the desk. And then there's a set of uh, sections on small area targets and wide area targets for those locations, uh, how we categorize them, how we want to use them, and what tests we might want to do with them. And there's a separate section for spectrophotometric standards. And then the thing that I wanted to call out, since it, you might miss it because you'll get to the references at the end, there's a pretty extensive set of references referencing all these fields, is, oops, there's a section, why does this keep happening? Sorry. There's a section uh, which tells you for each working group, like say for large scale structure or supernova, what their science drivers are, which, which led to their choices. And then we've collated a detailed description of all the fields, which I'll show you an example of in a second, along with references. So any of the fields that you find in those tables, you can flip to the back and there's basically an alphabetical collated index. You can look up that field and you can get all of the references to all of the overlapping precursor data sets, for example. So this could be useful to you. You might want to step up just a little bit, Chris, just looking at the time. Yeah, we're halfway, yeah, five minutes left. Great, thanks. Okay, so um, first of all, uh, we, we separated uh, things into classes of targets. So class one targets are those things that if we were doing some observations and even if, even if the situation wasn't perfect, just having any information at all, any, any image, even if it doesn't have perfect PSF could be useful. Class two targets are targets where we have enough observation that it's well matched to one year equivalent depth of the WFD survey. And class three targets are sort of best suited for DDF type things where we would reach the 10 year depth of the WFD survey. And then we also categorized every source by category. So you can tell whether or not it would be useful for astrometric, calibra astrometric calibration, things like clusters, if there are targets of interest, whether or not it can be used for photometric calibration, redshift tests, if they're time domain objects like um, strong lenses, for example, uh, time, time, time bring strong lenses, and things that have a lot of space-based imaging. Okay, so here's an example of that collated set of fields and references at the end. So if you just flip in the back, you'll notice this will tell you what working group was interested in it, uh, what it's called, this is the Euclid Deep Field South, uh, what, these are these categories. This tells you it could be used for um, photo Z or spectrophotometric standards. Or, I'm sorry, spectroscopy. Uh, and then you have all of the references that are there that are associated with it. And I just wanted to point out that sometimes you, you need to be careful because, for example, these are cluster fields. These are the frontier fields, the clash fields. We, we've, we've grouped those together here. So you'll, you'll see several of these names in the tables, all of these max guys, but the references for all of them are in one place. Okay, so what are the uh, high level recommendations of the desk? So first of all, I wanted to mention that, again, that uh, our primary interest here is testing the robustness of our analysis pipelines. We don't expect to do any cosmology with this data set. So we suggest that we observe analysis deep, deep trilling field to at least 10 year equivalent depth. 
start building uh, templates for supernova science, start with the DDF and expand across a wide range of right ascensions. Uh, so if we can do this in the same filters with one to four night cadence, we can start doing validation of light curves. Uh, observe contiguous wide field areas in places like Stripe 82. And it's really important that when we do that, we do it in multiple bands, the more bands, the, the, the better for photo Z reasons. Observe deep fields with deep high resolution uh, imaging like HST and on photometric nights, alternate multiband imaging of DDFs and spectrophotometric standards. We want to keep on going back to those spectrophotometric standards every night. So I'm getting short on time, so I'm, I'm going to go slightly quickly through this, but um, and you should read the note, but these are kind of the drivers for our decisions. So photo Z training, PSF characterization, uh, pipeline alerts production, template images for, for DIA for difference imaging, photometric repeatability, uh, understanding selection effects uh, that uh, change object detection. We have a lot of work happening on deep blending. That's very important for us. Accuracy of star galaxy classification and observatory telemetry. So these are all things that we want to build tests for that will be used with these fields. Okay, so just a few more slides. So let me show you the kind of um, uh, sort of output and, and, and figures that we made. So here, the, 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 first of all, if look at the one on the left, because it's a little easier to understand, this is for the spectrophotometric standards. So this shows you as a, as a, as a function of the date of the year, these are all um, sort of CalSpec standards and things from the Galtham's paper, which are dim enough that we can use in LSST. This show, shows you the optimal date to view it going across the year. The dark band shows you when the air mass is less than 1.4. The light band shows you when it's less than an air mass of two. Um, this is the same thing for all of those small area target fields that were in that table. So you can see it really, it really goes over the whole year. And you can quickly make these kinds of plots yourself if you're interested with the notebooks that we give you. So then what we did was we tried to give a set of prioritized fields. Um, so we were not trying to prioritize tests here, but this is at a given year, we tried to prioritize how many groups could use these fields. So in case, one of our hopes is that every you know, science collaboration does this and they have to collate all of our requests together. So if there's only a few that could come from us, we're saying, you know, please, if you can, in January through March, look, in the, look at the DDF Cosmos field and here are some backups. There's more, and all of these fields include references to the precursor data sets along with the rationale cases for why I wanna use them. And then you'll see there's also some, um, some graphics that show you where things are located on the sky. These are the priority fields overlaid with our wide fields, which I didn't have time to talk about today. And here's the spectrophotometric standards. Okay, so um, just finishing up, there's many more details in the note. I didn't have time to skip, you know, talk about all of them. I skipped many important topics such as dithering test suggestions, wide field observation strategies, our scientific drivers and all the references. So please see the note for more details. And in conclusion, a pretty diverse group of people, stop this, um, a pretty di diverse group of people in the desk thought carefully about what fields um, would be useful for Ruben during commissioning that we could also use. Uh, and in doing this work, you produced this note and really foremost in our mind was how we could help the whole Rubin community and, and, and build a set of tools and references that everybody would be able to use. And so I think I, hopefully that's been, that's been successful. Uh, we also hope this documentation on precursor data sets will remain a valuable reference to the community during science operations if you just wanna go back and see what precursor data set is there. Uh, a copy of this note has already been shared with your commissioning liaisons. Uh, we're going to post it to the archive, I think, soon. We have to collect all the software together in a, in, a, in a way that everybody could use. So please don't distribute it widely as it's still not been publicly posted publicly, but please do talk about it in your science collaborations, and we welcome your feedback and questions. That's it. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Chris. I'll go ahead and ask um, Meg if she could set up the slides for uh, the solar system. All right, let's see if this will work. All right, I think you can see this. Yeah, um, Hi, I'm Meg Schwamm. I'm co-chair of the LSST Solar System Science Collaboration. So we're gonna try to split this up in a couple different mini talks. I wanna say this is not everything we've thought about commissioning, but it's the things we've brought up in our sprints and discussions. Um, so just a smattering, there definitely will be more. 
Um, what I want to briefly talk about is just um, that we want to make sure that we put the Rubin Observatory Solar System Processing Pipelines through its paces. Um, and particularly one really cool data set that we can do that with is the Outer Solar System Origin Survey that has to has full detection efficiency, like 99.9% .9 detection efficiency for solar system, outer solar system, Kuiper belt objects um, in a wide uh, variety of fields on the sky that um, most of the limiting magnitudes are at or deeper than LSST is gonna go. So this is a really good data set if you wanna test um, on real data, right? Whether or not you're recovering all the objects and these objects have really good orbits, so it should be pretty easy to do. Um, and an interesting thing about this is that there's fields everywhere. So whenever commissioning is, there should be something that's doable um, during that time. And the thing that makes this data set even more exciting is that um, the Colossus uh, survey is getting colors in GI and J um, for the brightest of the ASAS targets, so 23.6 R mag and brighter. So this really makes it a nice set of being able to compare colors as well as be able to go deeper and do bigger studies with the same commissioning set that can be used to the, um, you know, putting the solar system pipelines through its um, paces. And I just want to mention on an EPO standpoint, you know, things that we want to look at, including comets, right? This is a HSC image, hyperspring cam image, showing uh, 67P that was uh, snapped accidentally in another observation. And you can really get a sense for the size of the camera, given how big the tail is. And so things that would be good for us to observe, for us to be working on community pipelines might also be really good EPO images as well. So I think there could certainly be some balance there. And I'll let Mike Kelly talk a little bit about bright comets and why that's important for our science and validation. Hi, yeah. Um, uh, certainly comets, they're found all over the sky. Um, so we'll be observed, especially if any fields cover the ecliptic. Um, but what I want to particularly suggest is that you consider observing the brightest comets available during the commissioning time. Uh, if we want to test the calibration methods that um, that they're robust in the presence of such a large topic or a large, large to target. This image here is Comet Wirtanen as imaged by ZTF. That's a two by two degree field of view. Um, it was an exceptionally bright comet at that time, um, but you know, it just, uh, every comet's a little bit different. Um, so whatever's available at that time. So you want to test, you want to make sure that the, that the pipeline is robust to astrometric and photometric calibration of the frame in the presence of this object. Does the transient pipeline correctly identify all the uh, transient sources or, you know, reject the ones that really aren't transients? Um, can solar system processing identify these bright comets and, and that they'll, we'll, we'll be able to process them as other com as other comets um, in the, uh, uh, or, or do we have to do special techniques in order to pull them out? And then finally, uh, just mapping a large cometary come. Again, the, so there's an LSST CCD for comparison and, and these comets can be quite large on the sky. Um, we want to be able to uh, map the uh, surface brightness profile across readout boundaries, CCD boundaries, refs, and Etc. Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, so Matthew, I'm going to stop sharing and see if you can want to, you can share to uh, do the next part. All right. Um, Perfect. Thanks. Hi, my name is Matthew Tiscarino. Uh, I'm at the SETI Institute, and I am uh, interested in looking at the faint inner moons of the giant planets. And uh, one thing we want to suggest for commissioning is uh, that we use the opportunity to get an idea of what the uh, scattered light patterns are for giant planets. Um, so when uh, the Rubin commissioning is needing to observe a bright source and to see what happens when you take it to uh, the point of saturation, uh, use a giant planet for that purpose. Um, kind of the, at, at the high level here, even one giant planet would be very valuable. And a second one of the other type, that being ice giants or gas giants, would be even more valuable. Um, a brief overview here of the reasoning. Uh, faint rings and inner moons of the giant planets present compelling science targets if uh, Rubin LSST is capable of doing time domain observations. Um, it is a big technical challenge to observe a faint target that's right next to a very bright source. 
Um, we think that these observations should be possible given the calculations we've been able to do, uh, but we can't really know for sure until we know uh, how faint an object uh, Rubin can observe in giant planet systems without observations um, and commissioning is the first opportunity to do that. Um, so uh, these kinds of images are ugly but useful. Um, the, what, I, what I'm showing here is, uh, this is an image from Hubble and you can see that uh, Neptune is in this case uh, completely blowing out the uh, uh, image with uh, all of this uh, glare, but only the column here is actually saturated, right? The saturated pixels are useless, you can't use them. Uh, but if you have a whole bunch of glare, but it's unsaturated, you have a chance of modeling it and, uh, and subtracting it away. So uh, that is what uh, my colleague Mark Showalter uh, did uh, with, with, with this particular image. Um, and you can see the result in this case was the discovery of a new moon of Neptune uh, called Hippocamp. Um, so the science quality of uh, the Rubin images are going to be governed by the detailed extended point sped function and the saturation patterns. Um, we think that the most scientifically interesting moons should be visible, um, but we need to know. Uh, so, and even if we, uh, we may or may not discover anything new, uh, but even if we don't, uh, time domain observations of the known moons uh, by itself would be highly valuable, um, especially at Uranus, but really at all the planets. But I mean, that's, that's talking about the, the, the value of the science going forward. But we know that a lot of these moons are on chaotic orbits, being able to use um, the LSST uh, repeated observations to refine their orbits would have a lot of uh, very useful science. Um, but back to the commissioning, um, what planet to use if we can only do one giant planet? Um, if it's all the same operationally, uh, Uranus would probably be the best choice um, just because it's uh, brighter than Neptune. Um, so we would put the, the kind of the, um, the extended point spread function through its paces a little bit more. Uh, but it's not quite as bright as Jupiter and Saturn, which might give a lot of saturation at the center of the point spread function, which would be less useful. Um, on the other, so, so if we only had Jupiter or Saturn, uh, we might be missing some of the center part of the extended point spread function. However, that would still be better than nothing if operationally it only works to have Jupiter or Saturn. Please do it. It would be really helpful. Um, if you can have uh, Uranus, it really would be best. If you can have Neptune but not Uranus, it's only a mild preference to have Uranus over Neptune. So. Uh, Neptune is definitely a strong second choice. And if it's possible to do two giant planets on two different occasions, it would also really be helpful uh, to have Jupiter and or Saturn. Uh, Saturn obviously has uh, the more extended uh, source because of the rings and it would be interesting to see how that changes things. And then Jupiter is brighter still. And so that would put the wings of the extended point spread function to, uh, to greater study. Um, so that's all I have. Great, thanks. And then we're ending with Hal Levison. So if you can stop sharing that and Hal, you can start sharing. Let's see if I can figure out how to do that. Can you all see that? There you are. Yes. We see it, thanks. All right, now let's go. So I'm Hal Levison uh, from the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, I'm the uh, principal investigator of NASA's LUCY mission. Uh, LUCY is the first reconnaissance of the Trojan asteroids. These are believed to be leftovers of uh, giant planet formation and therefore they're going to supply, we think, very important clues to the origin of the outer planets and delivery of volatiles and water to the Earth. Uh, LUCY is part of Discovery 14 um call uh we will launch in 2021 actually we uh enter outlaw next week so things are really busy we're going to do a, a flyby of a main belt asteroid in 2025 and have five encounters with trojan systems between 2027 to 2033 for a total of seven trojans um one one of our targets has a satellite and the last one which is my favorite uh, I'll talk a little bit, a bit about it in a second, is a near equal mass binary similar to what we see in the Kuiper Belt. So um, we've been able to cover a wide variety of different types of objects in the Trojans uh, due to an amazing trajectory. What you're looking at is the trajectory in green of Lucy in a rotating frame 
that rotates with Jupiter's orbit around the sun. So imagine putting a camera at the North Pole of the sun and rotating it every 12 years. This is what the orbit of Lucy would look like. We launch in 2021, go into a um, orbit that is basically one year. And then we use a series of um, um, gravitational sense assist with the Earth to pump up the orbit of the spacecraft to enter the Trojan swarms. First, we go through the leading or L4 swarm, which is on the left. And you can see we encounter four objects uh, during that time. Then we come back into the inner part of the solar system, have another EGA with the Earth, and then target our last uh, encounter, which is the Patroclus Menonitius near equal mass binary in uh, 2033. Notice the asymmetry here, and that's due to the fact that we decided for scientific reasons this binary is very interesting, and it happens to be near the outskirts of the swarm, and therefore the density of targets near it is actually quite small. That's why we only have one object in the L5 swarm at the right. So what I'd like you guys to consider is to search for other targets that we may be able to reach in the uh, L4 swarm before we get to Patroclus. Um, what I did, uh, oh, I should point out, there are two potential targets um, in uh, the survey. What you see here are mainly all the known asteroids uh, in the inner solar system. You can see the Trojans in green, uh, the main belt in uh, white, but notice also in orange are this population of Hildes that in a rotating frame with Jupiter sort of looks like a triangle and intersects the Trojan swarms uh, as they orbit. So there are two potential targets, the Trojans and the Hildes. What I did is I took the trajectory of the spacecraft and just launched potential uh, Trojans and Hildes from the trajectory itself. So what you're seeing here is an evolution backward in time from the time when the spacecraft goes through this region. Um, and you can see these are all objects. The blue or cyan, so the gray things are the Hildas, the red are the Trojans that directly intersect the um, trajectory of the spacecraft. And the interesting thing about this, not surprisingly, is that there are times when all these guys congregate in the sky. So if we want to try to find objects that are going to be particularly likely to be crossing the trajectory of the spacecraft, there are times for which we could look. And I'd like you guys to consider using some of your time to try to find these targets. So I will end there and take any questions. Thanks very much, Al. Great, thank you so much to the solar system uh, for presenters, that was wonderful. Um, I think in the interest of time, we should, we should go ahead and move on, but please post your questions in Slack and we can, we can continue uh, discussion offline there. Um, so the next presenter is, uh, is Lee Kelvin on the Galaxy Scoop. Hello, all. hope you can see that okay. My name is Lee Kelvin. I am the commissioning liaison for the Galaxy Science Collaboration. I just wanted to put together a few slides to give you an idea of the, some of the thinking uh, that's been expressed over the last uh, year or so uh, from Galaxy's Science Collaboration members on uh, attitudes towards commissioning. Um, so to begin, I just want to go through some of the key considerations that, uh, that we've been working on. There's a lot of data analysis pipeline work that's been ongoing in preparation for LSST uh, particularly the extreme uh, depth afforded by LSST opens uh, new frontiers, but also poses new uh, data analysis uh, concerns. So first on this list here, I have low surface brightness uh, science. <clears throat> this is a very big and active community in the uh, GSC right now. And this is everything from LSB dwarfs, stellar halos, uh, streams and tidal features, all the way up to uh, ICL. Uh, as you can see a recent example here from Montes and Trivia. So there's a lot of work ongoing in this field. Um, perhaps related to that is PSF estimation um, in order to construct uh, CERSIC convolved models or galaxy con PSF convolved models. 
uh, it's beneficial to have very broad PSFs. So uh, uh, that's a, an area of active work ongoing as well. Uh, characterization of other forms of scattered light is crucial. Uh, SED fitting and photo Z uh, calculations are very important. And also the appearance and handling of galactic cirrus, uh, which is scientifically interesting for some and uh, should be removed for other science considerations. So with those um, pipelines in mind, I want to talk very briefly about some of the desirable commissioning data set properties that uh, GSC members would, would hope to get from commissioning data in order to facilitate uh, testing uh, and integration. So the first, uh, as has been mentioned before uh, in other talks, is observations in multiple filters. This is obviously crucial for photo disease and other, other scientific work there, uh, but it's also very beneficial in other avenues. Um, talks about galaxy modeling or other things like that come to mind. Um, also full depth imaging where feasible um, for low surface brightness science. It goes without saying that having the deepest imaging possible during commissioning will allow for very robust tests to be made there. Um, a good amount of overlap with existing legacy multi-wavelength surveys or indeed spectroscopic surveys will allow for sufficient amount of comparison and uh, contrast to see uh, if what we're getting out of our pipelines now matches what has been done previously in other literature studies. Um, a broad range in environment would be very useful, everything from the field group up to the richest clusters environments uh, to again facilitate a lot of these scientific cases. And uh, also I think it goes without saying that uh, having commissioning data served in a manner that mimics the, the final uh, LSST day releases is, is probably uh, very important as well. I will highlight Harry Ferguson's talk tomorrow in the evaluating survey strategy session. He'll be speaking more on uh, GSC thoughts on that. So with those two considerations in mind, uh, I just want to, to flag up um, some of the, the fields that have been uh, most often recommended as, as interesting and useful in terms of commissioning. Uh, so the first is the Fornax filament, which obviously spans a range of environment all, all the way up to the very densest regions. Um, next, we have the, the kids, the two kids fields, kids north and kids south, uh, which has a, a wealth of ancillary data in, in those regions. Uh, Stripe 82, we've already heard about. Um, I think there's good synergies between uh, all of the Galaxy's science collaboration team and DESC uh, on this. Uh, I think Stripe 82, owing to its drift scan technique, is a very good test bed for a lot of LSB science. And also the XMM LSS region, which as you can see here, uh, overlaps with a number of other uh, surveys. There are another, uh, a number of other fields of interest, XSL North and South, Euclid Deep Field South, Gamma 23, Sen A, UKIDS Ultra Deep Field, and uh, three of the three more of the deep drilling fields, Cosmos, LIS, and the Chandra Deep Field South, have also been mentioned as, as useful. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Looks like we. All right, let's go on to uh, to Marcus uh, Rabas, uh, uh, presenting on behalf of the uh, Transients and Variable Star Science Collaboration. Marcus, you're muted. Okay, okay, I found it. Sorry, thanks. So my name is Marcus Rabos. I'm um, the TBS uh, commissioning liaison. Um, in TBS, we have created a commissioning task force. Um, the task force has uh, currently 14 members. Um, we have a broad spectra of uh, science cases. And um, so the rationale of the The rationale of the commissioning task force is uh, so as uh, Rubin Observatory is uh, commissioning soon at some point, uh, the project commissioning team has solicited uh, involvement of the science collaboration. Uh, the idea of the task force is to help to design a potential on sky observations which could be done during the commissioning phase, uh, define minimum requirements for the proposed uh, respective science cases, 
and maybe design tools and metrics to test the visibility on commissioning data. Um, we started with creating a questionnaire uh, where we ask people for some input. Uh, as we have seen from Chuck, there are three different um, surveys. So the 20 year depths, um, the survey one, which is a wide field survey, and a survey two, which is simulating the 10 year LSST depths. And there was also some uh, ideas from possible opportunistic observations, which could be um, one hour of observations during observa uh, engineering runs, which possible mixed quality, cadence, and depths. So here I have some preliminary results. Uh, we started by asking uh, which commissioning survey will help you to better test your science goals. So uh, all surveys were interesting. Uh, mostly the survey one, the uh, wide field, and uh, 20 year depths also interesting, but the full depths also. Um, we asked then uh, for the uh, 20 year depth test, um, which field would be of interest to you. So we have the bulge, LMC, SMC, Fornax. I think we will later hear something about Fornax from Massimo. Uh, we, we, uh, people were interested in globular clusters, deep fields, uh, anything extragalactic, preferentially including some nearby galaxies, away from the galactic plane and Lumen 16 and Wise 0855. Oh. And the filters on the right side, uh, so we have uh, also asked the filters. Um, all filters were um, present, but preferentially uh, GRI with some uh, U, uh, C, and little Y. Um, so for the survey one, the wide field survey, again, uh, bulge, LMC, SMC, some globular clusters, uh, nearby galaxies, um, proposed feeds also Sagittarius A, um, anything extragalactic, preferentially containing nearby galaxies, um, some mostly extragalactic, ideally overlapping with uh, DES footprints and away from the galactic plane. Uh, as for filters we ask, again, uh, GRI, the favorites, uh, and then uh, C, U, and Y. Um, the last survey was uh, the survey two, the 10 years LSST depths. We ask again, uh, this is similar to the uh, survey uh, uh, 20 year depths. So bulge, LMC, SMC, Fornax, uh, deep fields, globular clusters, and away from the galactic plane, and uh, Lumen 16 and Weiss 805. Um, we ask for some uh, filters again, GRI favorites. Um, we had some C and U, and again, a little Y. For opportunistic observations, uh, uh, many were interested in the bulge, LMC, SMC, Antila, and ARI2. And I also want to mention that uh, people were interested in the gravitational uh, run, which starts 04, which should start in, in 2022. We had an additional question, which is, are you interested in testing different exposure times or different observing techniques? like uh, star trailing. Um, though there was, for example, a paper by um, David Thomas about star trailing with LSST, and we did get some response. Um, some people wanted to create a gravitational wave sky maps. Um, some wanted to, uh, uh, were interested in real-time alerts and test uh, the follow-up ecosystem, um, testing uh, different exposure times depending on uh, the um, the number of bright sources. Uh, we had interest in testing longer exposure times for U-band. And uh, there was also an interest in testing uh, short exposure time and long exposure time in order to um, remove saturation of bright objects. And uh, big thanks for your contributions. Thank you, Marcus. I'll ask uh, Massimo to start sharing sharing screen uh, for the TVS and I think Milky Way 
with the volume signs as well. Uh, you're muted right now, Massimo. Yeah, oh, you're right, sorry. Oh, okay, can you see my screen? Yes, it looks good. Okay, thank you. Hello everybody, I am Massimo Dallora from the Italian National Institute of Astrophysics. I would like to, thanks for the slot, and I would like to discuss with you some uh, thoughts about uh, a couple of fields that, that uh, could be interesting for uh, the commissioning. Uh, the, the first one is the galactic bulge uh, for a list of reasons. The, the first one is that we already have uh, a, a deep and extensive uh, catalog of so variable stars from uh, Augur 4. So we have a benchmark to, uh, to tune uh, uh, our uh, algorithms to, to find uh, and characterize uh, variable stars. Then we have uh, uh, some deep and extensive photometric DCAM datasets. Uh, one is, uh, uh, was collected by Abisa. And, uh, and there are, uh, in these uh, datasets, uh, already available five out of the six LSST uh, bands. So we have the possibility uh, comparing uh, uh, to, uh, to compare uh, individual measurements and mean magnitudes. And uh, the other reason is that uh, the, the, the galactic barge is really crowded. The, and this is an acid test for crowding, both for field and globulars. And uh, in a TVS crowded field task force, we are uh, uh, doing some experiments with the PSF forced photometry. And uh, there is a paper in, uh, in preparation. Actually, there are two papers in preparation. Uh, one is about the, the, uh, the color magnitude diagram and of a, a given globular cluster, NGC 569, and with the variable stars. And the other one is an experiment with the, the scarlet the blender, which, which could be uh, interesting for the community. Um, of course, the galactic bulge is of broad interest of the community. And uh, here we have uh, four white papers covering uh, a, a, a wide range of uh, interest from microlensing to the three-dimensional map of the, of the bulge. Uh, the other target is the Fornax dual because uh, uh, it is located at the right distance to validate the depth of the color magnitude diagrams. Uh, here you can see a nice uh, uh, color magnitude diagram based on uh, uh, kids data in uh, uh, UGR and uh, I bands. And this is great for tidal tail, uh, tails because, uh, for example, uh, the difference between uh, the, the data uh, that LSSE uh, could be uh, taken on this field compared with uh, uh, what we already have in the literature, for, for example, from, uh, from uh, DECAM, it is uh, below R24. And this means that we can go. Uh, we can explore the main sequence stars and uh, uh, find uh, uh, tidal things. So uh, we, we can do uh, early science on this. Um, moreover, uh, our group has a, a long-term project on this uh, galaxy, and this is based on uh, Peter Setson uh, photometry, which spans more than 20 years. So we have uh, a lot of variable stars, more than uh, uh, 1,400 RRL stars, plus other variables. Of course, uh, uh, basically we have no analysis uh, in finding the, uh, these variables because of the huge uh, time span. The catalog has been published. And for LSST, for example, we could uh, uh, drive uh, the, the period of luminosity relation of RRL stars in the, in the red bands, in the Z and white bands. Uh, so what we already have is accurate and deep catalogs in Johnson uh, photometry, accurate and deep photometry in, uh, in the Sloan system uh, based on kids' uh, uh, photometry. And uh, so we can uh, compare very quickly uh, every outcome from the LSST observation what, uh, with what we already have. And so we have the possibility to publish paper in a very short time scale. That's it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Massimo. Uh, and then I will ask uh, Will 
uh, to share screen uh, on behalf of Milky Way Stars and Milky Volume. Okay, what have I got? One minute? Uh, uh, about. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you everyone for your attention. Um, I'm Will Clarks and I'm one of the three co-chairs of the STARS Milky Way Local Volume um, uh, collaboration. Um, uh, our commission, commission and liaison is, is Mike Rich at UCLA, who I believe is online uh, right now in this session. Um, so the quick, quick version. Um, is I think a lot of the um, sharpest expressions of point source photometry and astrometry goals um, appear in some of the hugely diverse science cases uh, within SNW or Reveal. There is lots of uh, complementarity with the other science collaborations and with the project's um, attempts to uh, characterize the camera. Um, it's important for SMW or V that the astrometry be characterized fully and early. Um, that includes the tie to Gaia and parallax uncertainties. I think equally importantly, um, we would like a dedicated experiment to characterize differential chromatic refraction uh, or DCR. Um, at, the very, at the very least, starting in G-band, um, observation is once per hour from far east to far west, covering, covering objects with a, with a wide range of, of colors. Um, in terms of actual crowded field performance, as well as generic uh, photometric accuracy, across all the six filters, uh, we would also strongly prefer observations of uh, fields crowded and non-crowded for which deep uh, space-based imaging is already present to calibrate performance in these regions. And I think, as I think Chuck alluded to this morning, um, in a way that we can, we can sort of subdivide the samples by seeing, you know, good seeing, bad seeing, how well do we do? Um, and it'll be, like I say, vital that those fields have space-based imaging. Um, for our science, uh, for a number of our science cases, uh, short exposure coverage is going to be required, uh, both in terms of determining the dynamic range over which we can get a particular precision, um, but also in terms of determining the impact of, let's say, a bright foreground object on a faint background science object, which many of our science cases may, may encounter. Um, I, I don't have a bullet point for it, but as Chris Walter pointed out earlier on, um, star galaxy separation is going to be critical for some SMWLV science as well. So that will likely require deep multicolor observations in towards uh, fields for which deep space-based imaging occurs. Um, that's where we are at the moment, but as it says on the slide, uh, more detailed gathering of information is still ongoing. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Um, so we are, we are uh, a little bit past the hour. I just want to, you know, on behalf of Chuck and I, thank all the science collaborations for preparing these, these excellent and really informative presentations. This is extremely helpful for us. Um, it's clear that there is a, a lot to discuss and a lot of potential, you know, synergies between the different science collaborations. And we'll, you know, we'll try, to, um, try to pull out some of the common threads here um, in our planning. Um, so I think uh, you should probably expect more uh, probably some more information from, from Chuck and I to follow up on, on a lot of the points here in the near future. Anything else you want to add, Chuck? Yeah, I want to say that um, uh, this has been awesome. Uh, this kind of input is exactly the kind of things that I think Keith and I have been looking for. Um, and um, the Slack channel has been very active uh, for the last hour. <laughs> um, and with some really good comments, really good feedback. And so, um, you know, maybe um, Keith, I'm going to throw this out as a as a brainstorm that perhaps uh, maybe sometime in the not too distant future we can have a an independent session on along these lines because um, uh, this this has been fantastic. I've been I've been I've been craving for this kind of input for quite some time now. And um, I think this was, may, maybe it's the, uh, it, it's the uh, COVID thing that gives people time to think about it and um, put their thoughts down and, and interact. But so um, I'm gonna propose that Keith, that you and I uh, brainstorm on maybe having a, uh, maybe a, a separate virtual workshop on, uh, to follow up on this because this there is a lot of stuff here 
for us to get our heads around. And I think this is the kind of input that we want. So thank you, everybody. That was excellent. I'm going to end the day as a happy camper, which is, which is, which is a, a new thing for me lately. <laughs> Great. Thanks again, everyone. And uh, we'll, we'll talk soon. Thanks for organizing. Thank Thanks. you.